this week on Q&A, Charles Blow, the visual op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Charles Blow, your biography starts with this. Charles Blow is the visual op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Since April 2008, his columns have appeared in the Times every other week and feature charts. Uh, no, let me read that again. And feature charts <laughs> as a form of opinion journalism. What's this all about? <laughs> People ask me that, same, that question all the time. Um, it, it's pretty much as it says. I mean, I am a numbers guy. Uh, not no, so much computational, but I, I'm a trend spotter. And I use charts to visualize those trends. And... I use those charts in my opinion pieces. I kind of build the opinion out of the chart. For me, the data comes first. Uh, I don't decide that I'm going to talk about a subject and then go out and look for data. I really do search for data first and see if there's so it says something interesting and something that uh, kind of agrees with an opinion that I have or kind of confirms something or sometimes surprises me and I think would surprise my readers. Uh, and I build out from there. I started reading you on Saturdays open up the Saturday Times on the op-ed page. There's always a big chart on there. Uh, when was it decided that they, they wanted you to do this? Uh, it was, I mean, I guess I started almost three years ago. Um, and I left the Times to become the art director of National Geographic magazine. And uh, it was a, a kind of an untenable situation in the sense that I never moved to Washington, D.C. The magazine's in D.C. I commuted from Brooklyn to Washington, and I'm a single dad. I have three kids. So I, at that point, I had three nannies. It was just an untenable situation. Um, so I came back to New York, and I just said, I can't do it anymore. My boss is there. said, fine, just you know, work from home. We'll see how we can work it out. And Bill Keller, who's the executive editor of the Times, kept harassing me the entire time that I was away, saying, Charles, you have to come back. This makes no sense. You have to come back to the Times. And one day I said, fine, Bill, let's have lunch. And we had lunch, and he said, you know, why don't you think about things that you would like to do at the Times if you were to return? And one of the things that I had always liked was they had this feature on the op-ed page called Op Charts. Um, and because I had done chart, I was doing charting and charts of the group that does charting for the news pages, I could never do an op chart couldn't cross that fence. I'd always wanted to do it. So I figured they were doing it all with freelancers. Why not have someone on staff to do op charts? And that was kind of the genesis of the idea. So how did you get into being a, a graphics specialist? <laughs> Complete happenstance. Uh, I mean, in college, my aspiration since high school was that I wanted to be the governor of Louisiana. I was uh, I was, I'm from Louisiana. I met the governor in, when I was a junior in high school. It was Edwin Evers at the time. It was right after he had said, you know, that his famous quote, uh, the only way I cannot be reelected is if I'm caught in bed with a live boy or a dead girl. I mean, he had such you know, what the young people call swagger. And he walks in, and we are in the mansion. He walks into this room, and I've never seen anybody with that much confidence in my life. And we spent our whole weekend that, that week studying governors of Louisiana, and they were all these charismatic, over-the-top people. And I thought, these guys are having the best time of their lives. I'd love to be the governor of Louisiana. Um, so in college, I majored in uh, English and pre-law. I was going to go to law school and then get into politics. You went to Grambling. Grambling State University in Louisiana. Uh, and one of my English professors actually pulled me to the side. He liked my writing. He pulled me to the side and he said, so what are you going to do if you don't go to law school with this English degree? And I don't think he liked his job very much. He said, what, are you going to be a teacher or an English teacher? I said, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm a freshman in college. I don't have the thought that far. He said, well, why don't you major in journalism instead of English? Kind of the same core. You still get to write. And if you don't go to law school, you... Um, can at least be have a trade and, and work as a journalist. And in journalism school, they made us pick a concentration. And you know, I wish I had more noble reasons than wanting to party all the time, but one of the concentrations was visual communications. And I, it came so natural to me, the visual part. I'd been you know, kind of an amateur artist my entire life. And uh, I chose that concentration. I've got to go back to your <laughs> earlier comments about Edwin Edwards. He, uh, how many years did he spend in prison? Oh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. And it was, I'm not sure if it was only one stint. 
Is it only one snake? I think. Well, he's out now, Yes, I guess. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes And yes. Uh, so what about that part of his life did you... Um, what well, did you think? Well, it's, it's very interesting in Louisiana. I mean, people, they're, they're not really punished so much as you would expect them to be for being kind of outlaws. And, and there's a certain amount of uh, kind of mystique about that kind of flouting the law, catch me if you can mentality. And in fact, I'm from a small town where it, it kind of is even more amplified. It's the, I mean, my town's claim to fame is, is the place where Bunny and Clyde were killed. They have a, a reenactment every year in, in the town of Gippsland of the, the kind of the shootout of Bunny and Clyde. And th this idea of not necessarily separating the good and the bad in the ways that we generally do and kind of idolizing and, and, and making heroes of villains is a very <laughs> seems to me to be a sort of Louisiana thing. Compare that with New York City. Is it, I think it's very different, actually. I mean, I, I, I mean, one of the things about coming to, to New York, I thought was very, was interesting. And people say, well, how do you move from a town of 1,100 people to a town of seven million, to a city of seven million people? And I find it very similar in some ways. If my neighborhood feels like the small town that I grew up in. I go to the same grocery store. I go to one dry cleaners. I mean, everybody knows you. It feels like my tiny town. In another way, though, uh, kind of in a sense of, of law and order, it's, it's, a, it's very detached um, in a way. It's, it's not uh, community driven. And the politics, I think, uh, are not necessarily as community driven as you would find in a small town. You wrote uh, on June the 12th, 2010, aside from the people who live in my building, I know the names of only one person who lives in my block, Roger Cohen, a Times colleague. I want to blame it on the fact that I'm absolutely awful with names and can be quite socially awkward. But that has ever been thus. Then I thought that maybe it was the city thing. But that explanation goes but so far. I'm actually beginning to believe that it's bigger than me, bigger than my block, bigger than the city. I increasingly believe that less neighborliness is becoming intrinsic to the modern American experience, dash a most unfortunate development. Go back to the beginning of that, where you say you're awful with names, but quite socially awkward. Why, why do you think that? I don't know. I, mean, I guess I should pay a therapist to figure that out for me. But um, you know, I, there's a certain, you know, uh, I'm a, kind of of two minds about myself. There's a very outgoing guy uh, who is never shy, uh, and um, but in small settings, I can be a bit awkward because I don't do the, the small folk talk thing very well. And uh, it creates a, a very weird thing because people expect the person that they see, I do a lot of television, they expect this kind of gregarious personality and laughing and joking. And uh, to some people I am, but kind of in these intimate situations with relative strangers, I'm not really that person. You mentioned earlier, and you talk about it in this column a little bit, you're a single father with three children. That's right. How old are they? Uh, the oldest is 17, and their twins are 13. Yes. What are their names? Uh, the oldest is Taj. The twins are Ian and Iman. And what's it like raising three kids like that? Hard. <laughs> How do you do it? Uh, it's a juggle, you know, and, and particularly with this job, uh, every job I've had, actually, uh, it, it's a lot of, it's, de it's demanding on my time. But I've learned, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years now, I've learned how to figure it out, how to juggle it, how to, to plan um, to make it work out. So um, you're at dinner with your three kids. You're talking about the world. What are the couple of basic things you want them to know about this life? Well, I mean, I, I get my biggest thing is I want them to be uh, good people. Um, I'm not, I don't push them necessarily to news or, or, but I want them to be centered and focused and good human beings, good citizens of uh, the city, the country, and the world, and to be open to difference 
um, and to be open to opportunity and to be open to challenges. And I feel like if I can, you know, kind of imbue them with those kind of basic skills, uh, the rest will fall into place. What's their reaction to a dad who's published in the New York Times? Do they know uh, anything they, about that? They they know, obviously, but they're not phased by it at all and not at all impressed by it and, uh, and in some cases irritated by it because I still have to take them to school and sometimes they'll have a television appearance and they'll have to go and they'll sit in a green room before school so that means they have to get up an hour and a half earlier. They're not impressed. <laughs> they don't like it. <laughs> what year did you graduate from Grambling? It must have been 1991. I think that's right. And what did you do after that? Uh, I had interned at the New York Times before that, and they sat me down and talked to me about that. You know, we could hire you, but we'd actually like you not to come here. We want you to go out and experiment and make mistakes somewhere else. This <laughs> is a very, it was the best advice I've ever gotten. Uh, I left there and I went, uh, when I graduated, I um, got a job at the Detroit News. Um, and uh, I interviewed in, it was snowing, and I got there at night. And so I thought all those big, beautiful buildings were, it was a great city and it was full of people. I didn't realize it until I literally got there the day I started work that all those buildings were empty and that, you know, it was a very different city than I was expecting. I learned to love Detroit. Uh, there's a certain grittiness about it and, um, uh, and a, an ability or a spirit to overcome. And there's a lot to overcome there, but, but there's a lot of great people there. But I did not like that weather. I stayed, I counted in winters. It was one and a half winters and I had to leave. What did you do there? I was, um, it was called the job was graphic artist, I think it was. It was a job title. Um, I had um, been trained at Grambling. Part of the mass comm major was that you, uh, you learn reporting and editing like everyone else. And in fact, I was the co-editor of this college newspaper before I left. I started a magazine as part of the newspaper. So when I got to uh, Detroit, my goal was to figure out a way to marry that reporting with what they wanted me to do in the graphics field. So basically I told him, you know, I asked the boss, I said, if something happens, I'm going, no matter where it is. And so I would, he said it was fine with him, and I, whenever some building would burn down or someone would be shot, I was there on the scene and just trying to report it out so I could visually tell that story. And that became a valuable skill because not, not a lot of people were doing that in that space at the time. Why did you pick Grambling in the first place, a historic black college? Um, first, it's 20 minutes from, my, from where I grew up. Second, uh, it is um, where my mother also went to college uh, and a couple of my brothers went to college. It was not my first choice. Um, I, you know, I, I had a wanderlust and wanted to get as far away from my tiny space as I possibly could. Um, and had been uh, accepted a couple of places and even full scholarships at other places. My mother, however, could not even imagine uh, her youngest son being far away from her. And she talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked, and talked until I relented and said, okay. Um, but it, I, found, I found it to be an amazing experience in one way. It, uh, and I think this is true of many historically black colleges. It removes the idea of race from education because if you do not succeed, there is no way to blame it on anything else other than your own inability to succeed. And having that experience for one period in your life is a very interesting experience. Um, if you don't get elected to the student council, it's because we don't like you. Uh, there is no other reason. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of freedom that comes as part of that. And, and I really enjoy that. But you uh, finished rather uh, well, magna cum laude. Yes. Um, where did you get the interest in learning? My mother. Um, my mother is a, an amazing woman. Um, she uh, uh, 
became a single parent after many years of marriage, and I was about five years old. I have four older brothers, um, and f kind of be even from before that point, all my life I can remember my mother going to school. She went back to school to finish her degree, and after that she took courses in the evenings and at night to get her master's degree. The entire time, I mean, I can remember sitting in the back of classrooms when she couldn't find anybody to keep me, and I would be doodling, and she'd be taking notes. And that, the idea of the ability of learning to transform a life is something that has been, you know, kind of instilled in me from the time I can ever remember her. I mean, she never watched television other than the news and the Wheel of Fortune and sometimes Jeopardy. Uh, she, uh, we were very, very poor, but one thing that she never gave up was a home subscription to the newspaper, which she read from front to back. So this idea of her constantly wanting to have this voracious knowledge, I mean, appetite for knowledge, and constantly wanting to improve herself, and me see, being able to see how that actually plays out in a life made it part of my life. And what kind of a profession did she have? She's a school teacher. The whole life? She, uh, is she still alive? She was a, yes, she is. Uh, she, was a, she was kind of an, a, a secretary when I was very young, and she kept going back to school. She became a school teacher. Um, eventually, she became, um, in a sense, it was administrator. I don't know if it was vice president, vice principal or not. And now, after retirement, she has just been elected to the school board in her parish in Louisiana. Four brothers, where are they? Two are still in Louisiana, one's in Texas, and one's in Mississippi. They do not believe in going past the Mason-Dixon line. And what do they, what do they <laughs> think of their brother that's up here and uh, visible? Um, I think, I mean, uh, we don't talk about it very much. I mean, we just kind of make jokes and, and have fun. Um, my oldest brother calls me often and says things, I mean, he, He's a, a big Obama supporter, so he says, you know, take it easy on my president, and uh, whatever that means, uh, or, you know, don't be so critical, uh, or he'll offer story suggestions or column suggestions for me, and I listen. Uh, but I, I think they're proud, uh, and uh, I'm, they're happy for me as I'm happy for them. I mean, they, they're amazing people in their own right. In three years of writing this column, what column has struck the biggest nerve? Um, it's a strange lot of things. One it was a column about dating, which, strangely enough, I didn't, I had no idea that it would uh, strike such a nerve with people. Uh, what did you say? It, I mean, I just marked something that some other people had marked in other ways, but. Um, that uh, it was called the demise of dating. It was the first time um, uh, that the data showed that high school seniors, there were more of them who said they had never dated than those who said they dated often. And I talked about how that was a shift. Uh, another was, uh, was a relatively recent one, which is about um, uh, acceptance of gays in the society. Um, it was the first time that, that uh, acceptance of, of gay relations, which is the quaint term that Gallup uses, uh, had crossed the 50% mark. But more importantly, it was the first time that more men found it more acceptable than women. And just kind of explored why that could be. Uh, the political things are, you know, they get whatever buzz they get. I mean, um, uh, a lot of them kind of have caught about the same weight and, you know, with some level of controversy or whatever, but that's kind of, I think our job is to be provocative in a way, not going too far, but trying to be a little provocative, make people think. What day of the week do you decide what you're going to write? Any day of the week it comes to me, I'll take it. But it, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking all week long. Um, again, I'm, I'm, following data. I can't make anyone conduct a survey. I can't make anyone publish a study. And so I'm kind of at the whim of what happens. So I'm c constantly monitoring, checking. Which uh, pollster is, for you, the most reliable? I think there are a lot of great outfits out there. Uh, there are some that are more regular um, 
uh, polling operations that are bigger, like Gallup. They're a big organization, and they uh, publish something daily, and that's great for me because I'm looking for volume. Uh, the Pew Research Center publishes relatively regularly. I mean, they always do s several a week, um, and that's great for me. There are other polling operations that they just don't, I mean, they don't have the money or the inclination to go into the field that often, so they produce some great material, but let not me, on Let a me test basis. you on one. Okay. You w if you go on the Drudge Report this day, I'm not positive about this, but I think you'd see a Rasmussen poll that showed President Obama 43% popular what would already what are you hearing from me that would get a reaction from you well the the times has uh, policies and standards about which polls they'll use so there are certain polls that the the times does not use uh, and I think Rasmussen is one of them and that, why would why would that be uh, I'm not exactly sure I think uh, I'm not um, it m probably is methodology I'm not exactly sure about that but in general uh, in terms of methodology, they like live interview polls. So if a person uses kind of robocalling, uh, you don't know who's answering the phone because there's not a real person to out talk to that person. So they don't like those sorts of polls. They don't like internet polling. Um, and all these are valid reasons for not doing this. And so there are some that you can kind of look at for reference and then try to find someone who is called live and see if that works out, but there's some that we just don't use. Is there a sample base that you will not use? In other words, if they only have 500 people called on the phone, does that trip certain things versus 1,200 people that uh, they talk to in person? You kind of want over 1,000. Um, you want, and when you look at uh, who has called, hopefully they've broken it down by kind of uh, race, age, ideology, uh, and you want it to be somewhat representative, it's not always perfect, but close to representative of the population at large. And if you see a real skew in there, you should take that into account. And if you're going to use it, say that there's a skew in the, in the sample if you can. I want to ask you about uh, three locations in your life. Go back to Louisiana. Uh, what kind of shape is it in today after Katrina and other things that have hit that state? I mean, it, it, my r relationship to it is is uh, is very distant at this point. I mean, I kind of visit my local area, which is as north. I mean, you go 40 more miles and you're in Arkansas, it's like as north Louisiana as you can get. Wasn't really affected by the hurricane. Um, and I hadn't visited, I, this year was the first time I'd been back to New Orleans. I actually didn't want to see it, uh, quite frankly. I, I kind of wanted to remember it the way I remembered it. Um, but when I was there, there were two things that were striking to me. First of all, you couldn't see the damage from, uh, from the airport to the hotel. Um, so I didn't see what a lot of people see. I, didn't, I just couldn't make myself go on one of these tours. Um, and I stayed in the French Quarter. But you know, there is a certain you know, change in the vitality and the fabric of that city. You know, the French Quarter has always been a kind of ruckus place along Burgum Street, and it is it is touristy, but it really began to feel more like Vegas than New Orleans to that weekend, and I couldn't put my finger on it. And I, you know, what what this change was, and I think it's and it is just the, the enormous displacement of the local population. Not that they were necessarily the people who would have visited Bourbon Street on a regular basis, but they were the workers, and they were the the, the panhandlers and they were the, uh, the, you know, the people who you would have seen populate that street trying to make it. And, and in the shops on the sides and what have you, it just felt like the fabric was different. And I think that's unfortunate because it was a special, special place. And part of what made it special was that it was the poor people who lived there. And those are the people who have the fewest options about returning and about rebuilding their lives. How much do you still want to be governor of Louisiana? Not at all. <laughs> Once I figured out that politics is a messy thing, uh, I gave up on that. What do you mean by messy? It's, you know, it, I think when you're a kid, 
you and you you know can you study politics and just in a kind of classroom setting and you you know you're president of your class or what have you were you president of your class yes i was president of my class from the sixth grade to twelfth grade to the twelfth grade and also freshman and junior years in college uh but you know that idealism wears off and you see what it means to run for a big office and the money becomes a factor and you know all the dirtiness that you have to get yourself involved in, all the dirty hands you have to shake in order to raise enough money to be a politician it, it loses its luster very quickly and the deals that you have to make means that it's you know I, I now tell people all the time I don't trust any politician ever because you just don't you have to do so many things to be a politician that are unsavory that it's hard for me to, to trust anybody 100%. Louisiana, then Detroit. What's, what happened to Detroit? I mean, when I was there, it was already a hollow city. I mean, uh, and if you go to the local barbershops, they say um, they elected a black mayor. Uh, uh, there were the riots. I don't know what the order is here. The riots, the black mayor, white flight out of the city. Um, I think there was a, in 67, the riots, I think there was, uh, Mayor Kavanaugh was his name, I think he was white. Right. And so the black mayor came after Afterwards. That. And, uh, and the city kind of never recovered from that period. And, you know, it just continued to decline. When I was there, the, the kind of r weird and striking fact was that you couldn't buy a refrigerator in the city of Detroit, and it was true. There were no appliance stores in the city limits. You had to go out, drive out of the city. Um, Why? Because they were, f I mean, they everybody, everything was fleeing the city. There was virtually no commerce left in the city of Detroit. Yeah? And so you had little mom and pop shops. You had a few chains, um, some, um, uh, only a handful of grocery stores, like real grocery stores. I, r I remember that we would uh, have to drive out of the city to do real grocery shopping. Um, so there was very, there's very little there to support the kind of s social structure of a city. And so that there was a trickle, 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 and it has only gotten worse with the recession. Um, and now, you know, you see images of this place and it looks like Warsaw or something. It's just an incredible decline of a major American city. So your th three children that you have are 17 and What's the other and age? 13. And 13. Choice, yes. Were born where? Uh, the oldest was born in um, Gross Point, which is right outside of Detroit, because my ex-wife did not want him to be born in the city of Detroit for whatever reason. Uh, the other two were born here in New York City. And when did you become a single father? Uh, that was 11 years ago. If you were sitting down talking to another single father, or maybe somebody that thought they were going to be a single father, what kind of advice would you give them? How hard is it? It's very hard, um, and, and it's hard in ways that, uh, I mean, I, there are a lot of women who do this all the time, so uh, I don't want to um, suggest that it's somehow worse because I'm a guy that people do it all the time, but it's a different experience. You, you know, um, uh, your friends are different so that, you, you know, uh, my mother could have asked any of her friends to keep me while she had to do something. I wouldn't ask many of my friends to keep my kids <laughs> while I had to do something. They're just not built that way. They're, you know, got, men don't think in, in that way. Um, and, you know, I, I write, I wrote, you know, a, a piece for Essence about having to learn to do my daughter's hair. It's a very strange thing. Uh, or having to uh, shop for her clothes, particularly her underwear. And like women are kind of looking at you. It's a very weird experience to be in a, gr in a store and shopping for a little girl's underwear. It's very strange. So there's these little moments in a life that make you understand how different you are, even among those who are different. What's the hardest part about it? The hardest part is, I think, what a lot of people experience in this uh when they're in these shoes, which is that you never feel like you're doing anything 100%. Uh, 
I never feel like I can give 100% to work. I never feel like I've done all that I can do at home. And there's a stress involved in that. And it never seems to go away. I probably shouldn't do this, but I need to ask you about how do you fix uh, a little girl's hair? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a process, <laughs> and it requires a lot of equipment. I actually kept it in a tackle box because that was the only thing I could figure out. It was like so much stuff. I went to the hardware store. I said, I need something to put all this stuff in, and the tackle box opened up. And I was like, this is perfect, and I put it in. But it's, it's a process. How does she like to wear her hair? Uh, different ways, which is the which is what makes it hard. So you're an expert. Uh, I am now, but now she's old enough that she does it herself for the most part, which is great. And uh, she doesn't, you know, do a lot of fancy things because now she's an athlete and she has she sweats all the time. So she just she's very basic now, which is perfect. So we've got Louisiana and we've got Detroit and Michigan and now New York City. Well, you lived in Washington for how long were you at? I never lived in Washington. Oh, you didn't. You were no. commuting all the time. Yes, yes. But you were at National Geographic for how many months? It was almost two years. I want to say a year and nine months. Is there anything, uh, just to talk about National Geographic for a moment, is there anything about that magazine that you found uh, unusual or interesting after you got inside? Well, I mean, I, first I think that it's an amazing place and I think that, you know, and on some level, they're doing God's work. They're just doing this, something that no one else has the ability to do or, or the, the financing to do, and it's amazing. And uh, it was the only place, I used to say this before they called me and asked me if I wanted to do this, that it was the only place I would leave the Times to go. Um, I have always been in awe of the, uh, the kind of, the visual impact of that magazine. Uh, there, though, you understand what it takes to put it together, and it is a very long process. So you are planning stories, you know, this, you go to a meeting this week, you're planning a story that's not going to show up for a year and a half. That's a very long process. You kind of, you know, you, you become very intimate with the information, but it drags for a while, and that can be its own sort of stress because you have so many opportunities to go back and change and change and change that you actually take those opportunities and you, you, know, you can change to the point where you, you know, you can make, you're making work to make yourself busy. What did you get a sense from being there uh, is its future? I mean, I, I think it's lost some circulation in recent years. Right. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I, what I did sense was that there was a strong international presence for the magazine and in some cases may have even been growing and that and it was still a premium product in many of the other countries so here you get it very cheaply but there it was not it's a premium product and you know some combination of you know National Geographic as an international geographic and as a as a web product I think could be very viable I mean I think I, I I think it may look really bad for many magazines, including them, but I think they have an opportunity. January the 23rd, 2009. Sounds like a familiar date, right after the inauguration. Uh, you have a headline on your column that says, no more excuses, question mark. And you begin by writing for the presidential inauguration, blacks descended on Washington in droves with a fanatical Zacharias-like need to catch a glimpse of this MLK 2.0, 2.0 um, to Martin Luther King, Obama, spelled with three O's. For them, he was it, a game changer, soul restorer, dream filler, everything okay. And then you quote James Clyburn of South Carolina, the majority whip, who's an African-American, is saying every child has lost every excuse and then you say, what? That's where I have to put my foot down. That's going a bridge too far. Help us out. Well, I think that, you know, a lot of people, uh, I think uh, Representative Clyburn captured the sentiments of a lot of people that everything had changed uh, with the election of Obama. And what we're seeing is that that is 
kind of the farthest from the truth. And in fact, we're moving into a, an area in, in the kind of national consciousness that we have not been in, in before, where people on the one hand want it to be true that many things have changed and the facts remain stubborn that uh, that family life has not necessarily changed, that economic conditions have actually gotten worse for a lot of people, partly because the recession has nothing to do with uh, Obama, although it's becoming more to do with him as it becomes more his economic issue than it was Bush's. Uh, and you see kind of the reactions that people are having around the issue of race, whether or not certain actions can be categorized as racist, whether or not bringing up the idea of race in and of itself makes the accuser the racist thinker. Um, it, everything has gotten very muddy, but the, these kind of stubborn facts remain a problem. And so I think when people start to say things like, no one ever has an you know, excuse anymore for anything, well, that's not true. And it's problematic to make other people think that that is true. Uh, that said, there's a lot of personal responsibility that people have to take, and I think that what the polls are showing us is that people are beginning to take that more. It was, I saw one poll, it was the first time where African Americans thought that their issues were more their own fault than they were the, the impact, because of the impact of racism. That's a big move forward, I think, in thinking. And that, that does come because of Obama, the prob problem is that the, the facts don't necessarily change on the ground and the way that other people perceive you, not just how you perceive yourself, have to change as well. And I think that we, we have to get in that space and negotiate those issues. Uh, you wrote on February the 19th of this year uh, under the headline, uh, Empire at the End of Decadence. You start off by saying it's time for us to stop lying to ourselves about this country. America is great in many ways, but on a whole host of measures, some of which are shown in the accompanying chart, we have become the laggards of the industrial world. Not only are we not number one, USA, USA, we are among the worst of the worst. And the charts show what? There were measures like uh, income inequality. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, 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 measures of well-being, measures of food insecurity, and you know it was like seven or eight of them, and in most of those categories, we were among the worst of the worst when compared to other thirty-three other industrialized countries, and people don't generally think of us that way. We 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 have this kind of mindset that because we're the biggest economy, because we have the strongest military, that 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 because we in in fact do have uh, some of the most inventive. Um, people in America. I mean, that's the iPad, internet, you think Facebook, it comes from the U.S. But there's a lot of measures on well-being where large swaths of the population are not doing well at all. And until we acknowledge that there's a gap between those who are succeeding and those who we see on television and those who, you know, the wealthy women on desperate, you know, housewives of wherever, and the people who actually live in those cities on the lower rungs, then we can't really say that we are number one because we're kind of falling backward on some of these measures. You say the Republicans have even submitted a draconian budget that would make deep cuts into the tiny vein that is non-security, discretionary spending, cuts that would prove devastating to the poor and working class at the very time that many Americans and the very country itself are struggling to emerge from a deep hole, the Republican proposal would simply throw the dirt in on top of us. Well, there, there, are, some, there are so many areas where it, it makes no sense to cut, particularly in education and well-being of young people. And there are a lot of cuts in there that go directly at um, food, st uh, food stability for pe poor people and young people in particular. Uh, I wrote another column about um, uh, cuts that would have a direct impact on infant mortality, which we are also now number one in uh, among those 33 industrialized countries. That does not plan for a future where you want to reemerge as number one 
in terms of strong populace, healthy people, strong thinkers who are smart and capable. And, you know, if you look at, if you just take, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of math to, to deal with these bigger emerging economies either. You take China, for instance, which is not one of the 33, but it's a, what, a big emerging economy. They have so many more people than we have. So if you just take, you know, the top 10% or 15% of their students and assume that those are their honor students, well, then they have more honor students than we have students. So all of a sudden, the math says we don't have students to waste. You know, there, we can make the educational cuts. In fact, we need to reinforce education because all of our students, we need all of them to compete with their top 10 or 15 percent. Uh, we can't, you know, uh, cut Pell Grants because we need each person who graduates from high school to go ahead to college, no matter how poor they are, because we need them. Once we realize that we don't have disposable people, we, once we move beyond this concept that we want to penalize people who had children who maybe they couldn't have afforded or whatever I w you should pay a penalty for this you should struggle for that well maybe if you had them as disposable people and we didn't need e everybody to compete with the outsourcing that's happening in India maybe we could afford to do that but we can't afford to be punitive at this point you started off that column um with a sentence, it's time for us to stop lying to ourselves about this country. Uh, how, how hard is it to write that first sentence for all your columns? It's gotten a lot easier. Um, it was hard at first, uh, but... What are you looking for? I'm looking for something that grabs you. Uh, something that's um, simple, clear, um, contains a thought and some forward momentum that pushes you forward to want to read the rest of the column, but an entry point that is enticing. On uh, August the 27th, 2010, the column's headline, by the way, do you write your own headlines? Yes, I do. And that's the way it is with all New yes. York Times columns. Yes. Uh, the headline is, I had a nightmare. I'll jump down to one line and you can fill in the rest. Glenn Beck is the anti-king. I mean, I just found it to be incredibly offensive. This. But what was your idea. nightmare, though? Start with that. Well, well, the idea that you know it's kind of play on uh, Dr. King's "I Have a Dream" speech. It was the this thing was taking place on the anniversary of that speech. Um, but the idea of you know he he spent a lot of time trying to co-opt, and you know I may still be doing this, but I I tuned into a couple of programs where he would take you know the 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 kind of um, the marching marching orders that were given to protesters and say this is what we should do in the Tea Party or uh, you know this is King's dream and we're the fulfillment of that dream it's I mean there's a certain point at which I can stomach some of this nonsense but enough and that was that uh, that too was a bridge too far for me is a, um, what when you watch Glenn Beck not regular thing you do not not a regular thing. Isn't he one of those characters that anybody that works around the New York Times would say, yeah? I, I, I mean, I do think there's a certain entertainment value. These are, you know, uh, they're provocative and shocking because it makes them a lot of money. Uh, I even have a hard time believing that they believe all the things that they say. It's just so ridiculous in some, some days. Um, but, um, you know, to each his own, but I, I don't have to take part in that and I don't have to watch it and I don't think, you know, I try to just, you know, I would discourage everybody from watching it, but if you want to be entertained. How often do you dip into the conservative talk show host world? I, well, I try to follow them on Twitter and social networking just to see what their headlines are, what people are saying, or uh, I'll check uh, websites, the bigger ones from time to time, particularly if there's something in the news that I think that they would be weighing in on. I just want to just see how, uh, uh, what they're saying. I also, and sometimes there's some fair stuff. You know, it can get muddy with some things that I don't think are fair, but I think there's some fair things there sometimes. Um, and I publish my email address on all of my columns because I do get a lot of unedited, um, commentary from people on the right and I you know weed out the obviously offensive things but some people make some really interesting points and I think it is important for people in positions like mine to at least have an ear open to 
opposing views. What's it like to have the conservative talk show host run daily against the New York Times? Uh, I don't care. Does the New York Times pay attention in, inside you? I don't ever hear anybody talk about it. If it's the huge following out there in the country, um, they constantly I listen to them. They beat up on the New York Times as being the Antichrist and a few other things. I, I don't pay any attention to it. I don't know anyone else in the building who pays much attention to it. I mean, I think the newsroom may be more sensitive to it because they are really striving to be objective and they really are trying earnestly to kind of shoot straight and down the middle. I'm in the opinion side. I have an opinion. You have one. Yours is different from mine. I really don't, you know, it doesn't bother me. What part of this area do you live in? Um, in Brooklyn, Park Slope, Brooklyn. And how often do you go into the office? As often as needed. I mean, I, I, if I can uh, work from home, I'll do it. Okay. And how often do you get ideas for a column outside of either a poll or a survey? And if you do, where do they come from? Well, I have, I have idea, I would, you know, ideas all the time and things that I would love to write about that I can't find data to support and therefore I can't produce a chart, so I don't write it. Um, but uh, I follow pop culture quite a lot, and there are a lot of things there that I would love to write about. And you know, uh, contrary to what many may believe, I'm not a political nerd at heart. <laughs> I even though I write about politics all the time, uh, but I, I have a broad range of interests. It's just that some of them feel too light for that space and some of them don't have data to support them, so I don't write them. This is a column from um, February the 5th, 2010, and the headline is Obama gets his groove back. And, uh, you know, thinking back, that's a year ago, and it, the, the first sentence is, where has this Obama been, question mark, since the State of the Union address, the president has been bounding about, displaying a new sense of vigor and confidence and a fighter's spirit he almost looks like the president people thought he would be, a paladin, not a pacifist. I could go on, but you were making a point a year ago, and how does that trend with today? Uh, he, he's, some parts of the president um, changes, and this kind of vigor comes in spurts and then disappears, which is you know, interesting because you don't know why that is, um, and you don't know who you're going to get this for this three months the person we're getting now is incredibly quiet, uh, eerily so. Uh, there's quite a bit happening. You rarely hear from him directly. Um, uh, the North Africa and the Middle East is incredibly unst unstable. Um, uh, you have the situation in Japan, you have the situation in Wisconsin. And, you know, and this is a president who said, particularly of the situation in Wisconsin, in 2004, uh, 2007, he said, if there's an attack on, on uh, collective bargaining, I'll put on my boots myself and I'll be right there with you. Well, you know, that wasn't true. And he's not only not there, you barely heard a thing about from him on that subject. So you don't know who you're going to get. Um, and when he's on, he's great. And, and he can be a very galvanizing figure. Uh, but I think sometimes he and his inner circle, the calculus is that it's better for him to hang back and you, know, you get this person. What's your sense of who would be the strongest opponent for 2012? It's a very interesting question because the, the energy in the midterms is obviously coming from the Tea Party, but it is very hard to, at this point, to figure out who a Tea Party candidate would be. Because, you know, the strongest candidate, one of the strongest candidates, Mitt Romney, who is not necessarily a Tea Party, I mean, I guess you would call him a rhino if, if you were going by their definitions. And on the other hand, you have the strongest of the Tea Party types, which is Huckabee, who's basically keeps saying he's not running. Um, the Palins of the world, I mean, they're kind of interesting personalities, but I don't, even in the polling among um, Republicans, she's not doing very well. I don't think people see her as a presidential candidate as much as a interesting personality on for the cause. So, so it's hard to figure out 
you know, if Romney became the candidate, would he have the energy from that Tea Party crew? Or if you did find a Tea Party candidate, are they in any way electable? I want to combine a couple of your columns. One from October the 23rd, 2009, The Magic of Michelle. Forgive me in advance for fawning, but Michelle Obama is the coolest first lady ever. She clinched it for me this week by jumping double dutch on the South Lawn as part of a healthy kids fair. And later on you say she has become a powerful symbol of fearlessness, refinement, frugality, and frivolity, managing to be both fun and serious simultaneously. She's genuinely human. Now you say frugality. Since you wrote that, she went to Spain for a five-day luxury trip to the Ritz-Carlton owned resort out there. Uh, and when you talk about um, some of the other things, fearlessness, she's kind of withdrawn as to what her political views are a lot. Would you write this same column today? A lot. It, it's something to have seen. I mean, on the trip thing, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, there people have made a lot of of her spending too much money. I don't. I don't necessarily um, buy into that. But I do think. The, on the fearlessness part, um, she's kind of operating on the same calculus as the president, which is better to say little or nothing, even while being attacked. And it's kind of a more graceful, stately position, but the, the attacks on her at this point are intense. Even, I mean, I wrote this past weekend about uh, uh, attacks on her um, uh, childhood obesity campaign, which you would think would be, you know, kind of a slam dunk issue, but it, you know, the people have revved up the attacks on the first lady, and her position has kind of been to sidestep it, it all. That was the second column I want to bring in. Combine it with that one, your column that you wrote on March the twelfth. Um, under the headline, The Biggest Losers. And you get the nice center position usually in the Saturday time. Very nice, nice real estate. You start off with this question, should the government have a significant role in reducing child obesity? You write, that's the question the Pew Research Center began asking poll respondents a few weeks ago. Nearly 60% said yes, only 40% said no. And that's 60% said yes, should the government have a significant role in reducing childhood obesity? And then you have a big chart showing the states, the west, the middle west, the south, uh, and the north, northeast, I believe. No, northeast isn't in there. Pacific. Anyway, what got your attention on this, and why do you trust Pew? I think Pew's a, a great polling group, and they have uh, uh, big samples. I've tr we trusted them at the times for a very long time. I use them all the time. Uh, they're a great group. Um, what, what got my attention here was, you know, being from the South, I kind of already was familiar with this fact, which is that the states uh, that are the most conservative, conservatives are, are bashing the First Lady for this approach, but the states that tend to be the most conservative are also the ones that have the biggest issues with obesity, which obesity in general, childhood obesity, and the, the, the uh, accompanying um, problems that that brings along. And just wanted to point that out, that they have the most to gain um, from dealing with this issue. And it shows uh, on the charts, for instance, uh, the question is percent overweight obese children in 2007, and you go down to south in the south in Mississippi, which is on the bottom there, it's 44.4% compared to a state like South Dakota where it's only 28.4. Right, right. How long does it take you to do that column and work out all those numbers, and do you do the graphics? I do the graphics, that's the fun part. Um, it, once I have figured out what I want to write, it's not a long, it's not hard to do. Um, the problem is, for me, the challenge is finding a subject that, you know, that sings, that, you know, the newspaper term is the, a sexy topic, the one that people will want to read, the one that has something new, brings something new to the table, a new way of looking at it, some analysis that only I can deliver to the subject. That's the harder part. Um, you could write three of these things a day, I think. Uh, finding something that is great is not so easy. So um, somebody comes to you for advice, 
uh, they say, uh, Mr. Blow, and you're talking to some kids, and mm -hmm. you've been how many years? Eight years president of your class through high school and yeah, college? Yeah, I was, yes, yes. Graduated magna cum laude, you're a good student. You had a mother that put her thumb on you the whole time and said, do this, do that. You become a high profile columnist at the New York Times, and everybody says, I want to do that. What would you tell them? How, do, how can they get it done? I would say, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how I got it done. I mean, it's, it, I, would, I didn't set out to do this, so it feels like everything that has ever happened in my life has been some part skill, some part uh, hard work and determination, some part luck. And uh, being in the right place at the right time, um, but what I do tell people, because I do talk to kids all the time, I said, you know, I say, find something that you love, and whatever your job is at that moment, put your head down and do that job 150 percent. What I find a lot of people like to do is to game out their whole lives, to say, oh, I want to do this at this point. So I'm trying to figure out how to, the quickest way to get from what I'm doing to the next stage, to the next stage, to the next stage, and. And maybe that works. In my life, it has not, that is not the way I've played it. I have played it by trying to be the best at everything that I was doing at that moment. And another opportunity has always presented itself. You know, I didn't ask you earlier, what happened to your dad? My dad still, he still lives in Louisiana. Uh, uh, the, only about 20 miles from my mom, so they're very close. And he's always at my mom's house. She still does his taxes. They're a sweet old couple bickering back and forth and also kind of uh, getting along. It's very cute to watch. How long have they not been married? Um, they've not been together since I was five. I'm not exactly sure when the actual divorce was because it wasn't a thing. Charles Blow, columnist for the New York Times, we thank you very much for your time. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, call 7726 for free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Coming up in a few minutes, Prime Minister